Welcome everyone to our second installment of the Decolonizing Mental Health webinar series. Uh, we're really happy to have you all here today. The webinar today, we're going to be questioning the role of the medical industrial complex. And I am Isha Warasingha. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, and I am a South Asian woman with black hair, black curly hair. Uh, I'm wearing a short sleeve tropical shirt, uh, sitting on an office chair in, in an office. And I um, am a senior policy analyst on the youth team at CLASP. Um, I lead the mental health work here at CLASP. And this decolonizing mental health webinar series is something we're really excited about. Uh, we are really trying to explore how we think about mental health and well being. Um, and before I introduce our guest today, I just want to go through a little bit of housekeeping. So, first of all, if you want to watch this webinar with captions, please make sure you've selected show captions in the Zoom member Zoom menu. It will be on the bottom of your screen. And then make sure that your language is set to English. Anytime throughout this webinar, please feel free to include questions in the Q&A box. Um, you don't have to wait to the end to put questions in there, but please make sure to include them in the Q&A box and not the chat box. And we'll have um, hopefully around 15 minutes for Q&A after uh, Karen and I have a, some, a chance to, to speak today. Uh, so I'm going to give an intro, introduction to class and our mental health work. And while I'm doing that, if you all could introduce yourselves in the chat um, with your name, if you feel comfortable doing so, pronouns, if you feel comfortable doing so, as well as your organization and where you're coming from, it, it would be great to hear where, where you all are dialing in from. So CLASP, we are a national nonpartisan anti-poverty nonprofit. Uh, we work on policy and advocacy solutions and we focus on people living in low-income households. We focus on the local, state, and federal levels, um, on policies that work towards eradicating po poverty. And we really center uh, the voices of lived experience and we center racial equity and health equity writ large. That is, uh, centering the voices of lived experience is central uh, to our work. Our mental health work and well being work has been going on for the past six years or so. And with that, the, the ways of thinking of centering voice, voices of lived experience, including a, a lot of young people, and um, centering marginalized populations has been core to how we think about mental and behavioral health. So here I, I put uh, some screenshots of some of the many publications we have out. Um, and all of our work is in, informed by people with lived experience, by um, local and state practitioners, and by our mental health advisory board, which um, we had put together a couple of years ago, uh, which you can find on our website. And Kara, we were very thankful to have Kara as one of our uh, mental health advisory board members, as well as policymakers as well. And um, uh, the the what you see on the right, the core principles to reframe frame mental and behavioral health policy is really how we look at mental and behavioral health policy. I'll put a link to that in the chat um, after I go through these slides. And I also encourage you all to look at that if you haven't already to just see how um, we root our, our work in mental health policy. And our core principles are, um, we have six core principles, and I'm not going to go through all this because I want to spend the majority of our time today talking talking to Karen, hearing from her. Uh, but the first core principle is in to redefine mental health because we know, and I know all of you are on this call because you know that our mental health system is broken. And this um, webinar series was developed by my colleague Kayla Tawa and myself to really think about how we can explore different ways of um, addressing mental health policy and uh, both in youth mental health and parental mental health and, and looking at um, how mental health could be better, better addressed for uh, marginalized populations. So with that, I'm going to introduce Kara. So 
Kara, we are very, very lucky to have her here with us today. She's a cultural organizing director of Changing Frequencies, which is an abolitionist organizing project that designs cultural, cultural memory work to disrupt the harms and violence from the medical industrial complex or the mic. Um, she's also the co-founder and co-designer of the Healing Histories Project, and she's a core leadership team member and co-founder of the Kindred Southern Healing Justice Collective, who are the architects of the political strategy Healing Justice. And with Erica Woodland, she just edited, co-edited the new anthology Healing Justice Lineages, Dreaming at the Crossroads of Liberation, Collective Care, and Safety, which we're going to focus our discussion on today. And that's the book. If you haven't um, gotten it already, highly encourage you taking it, taking out from the library or getting it at your local bookstore. So I just also wanted to note that Kara and I had a conversation in 2020 about healing justice. Um, I will also put a link to that in the chat. It was a really um, informative discussion and very also very, very thankful that Kara was there with us in 2020, which was part of our healing-centered liberation policy work that we were doing, um, that we started in 2020. So with that, I am going to pass it to Kara. Hi, everyone. It's an honor to be here again with my dear comrade and colleague, Isha. Thank you so much. And to be with CLASP and all the communities that you gather to do powerful work um, on the ground. Thank you for all your work, CLASP. And uh, certainly a pleasure to continue and first coming on as an, on the, as an advisory board member and now being in political um, conversation and cultural conversation with all of you. I am a, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I am a light-skinned Black woman with my graying silver hair pulled back um, and I'm wearing bright teal blue glasses with um, the gold yellow and light blue um, beaded Kenyan ear or earrings from Kenya and wearing a white shirt trying to stay cool in this heat y'all wearing a, a light white um, button up shirt with a white tank top underneath and you'll see some jewelry on my hands silver silver rings my backdrop is a quilt, a uh, hand-dyed, hand-woven quilt from central Mexico with deep orange, uh, green, purple, and black colors showing flowers crawling up the wall. And you'll probably see some of my off-white wall as well behind me. So I wanted to just start this conversation with you, Isha, again, just to reground us in healing justice. And as you mentioned, I am here now having co-authored a book with Erica Woodland um, on the lineages of healing justice. For me, as, a, as an organizer, as a cultural worker, and as a, a curator, if you will, of conversation and political discourse around the role of collective care, safety, and really understanding how we build care and that goes beyond constructs of health that have not really been defined or often led by our communities. So Healing Justice was created out of political discourse and organizing work on the ground in the South in 2005, or I should say the US South. We were deeply informed by the Global South, watching healers from different parts of the world really identify ways our traditions are integral to our political work. Out of that came the need for us in the US-based South in response to um, really organizing against a tremendous, tremendous amount of generational trauma um, from colonization and slavery. But if you recall in the early 2000s, there was immense um, anti-immigration um, anti reform um, in the Southeast, anti-Black racism, anti-immigration violence, um, and a heightened fascism that was really starting to build in the, in the beginning of the century. And at that time, healers and health practitioners were being called in to hold trauma and to hold care and to think about grief um, and safety 
in relationship to political movements in the South. And out of that came Healing Justice, where we started to look at we being healers, health practitioners, root workers, culture workers, birth workers, um, people who were really called in to hold care strategies, but we were rooted in an abolitionist frame and wanted to reimagine ways we think about collective care and safety, ways we think about public health that centered a social justice lens. So for us, down at the bottom of this slide, it says seeks to intervene on generational trauma and to build collective care towards resistance. That is what healing justice was for us, is how do you talk about healing and how do you talk about justice in response to trauma that we don't see as isolated incidences or as individual experiences, but actually as collective experiences of generational trauma from oppression. And what you see on this slide are the other movements and political strategies that deeply informed healing justice, that being reproductive justice, disability justice, environmental justice, harm reduction, and transformative justice. So I'll go to the next slide. And what we want to just remind you as our initial conversation Isha and I had in 2020, which seems like yesterday, is that we have three principles when we talk about healing justice. And again, this is a political strategy. Some people refer to it as a movement. If you read the book, Healing Justice Lineages, you'll see more about why we we position it as a strategy because we want it to be integrated inside of all movements and community-led um, ideas of care, collective care. But our first principle is collective trauma can be transformed collectively. And to imagine that we look at care and look at responding to trauma that doesn't need to individualize or just look at responding to behavior but actually looking at the conditions and ways that we think about transforming trauma in collective experiences of how we have been immensely impacted um, by abuse, by harm, by violence, and by resistance and resilience. And how do you hold those things interdependently of each other collectively? Principle two is that we don't believe there's a single model of care so that we have never inside of the healing justice political framework. Hello, there I am. <laughs> healing justice political framework. We've never um, identified one type model tradition of care as the only way to heal or transform from generational trauma. But instead we invite a cross generation of traditions. We invite um, Western-based mo modalities of care that value building with other traditions of care um, and doesn't create a, a division that allopathic medicine is more important or more invaluable than other types of, excuse me, other traditions of medicine and care, be that energy, earth, body-based traditions, be that birth working, you know, how do we understand care as something that is very complex and cannot just be centrally located in one model? And then principle number three is that healing strategies or collective care strategies are rooted in place and rooted in ancestral technologies. And just to unpack that a little bit is just, again, honoring what are the lineages and traditions of care that we know for our families, that we know from our community's survival and resilience despite slavery, slavery, attempted genocide or colonization, that we are pulling forth technologies, memories. I always talk about healing justice as memory work because we are remembering ancestral traditions, not all of them, but those traditions that we find are still relevant, still useful for the collective care and survival of our communities. And that we look at healing must be rooted in place. Um, just to clarify, how do we make sure that we're looking at collective care for our communities in relationship to the context and the conditions of where we live and how we are living our lives? And I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Kara. Um, 
Okay, so, and thank you, I know I was sharing my screen so I couldn't see the chat. So thank you all for um, including yes. information in the chat. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, and also just re-encouraging you all to um, put in your questions uh, in the Q&A box. So my first question for you, Kara, is as the title of the webinar is questioning the role of the medical industrial complex or MIC, um, I thought that it might be good to start with setting some groundwork. Uh, so how would you define the medical industrial complex? Yes, thank you. I'm gonna take the bold move of using the book. Um, again, this anthology of voices. I wanna quote a dear friend, colleague, and co-founder of the Kindred Human Justice Collective. Oh, that is the group that created human justice as a political strategy. And Rita Valenti, an abolitionist and retired nurse and founding member of Project South and Kindred Collective says in the book, quote, the medical industrial complex is an outcome of private ownership of land, medicine, human beings through slavery. It is the expression of treatment given to protect an investment, such as humans as property, or to advance profit through experimentation on human life. The medical system is a corporate system. It is a system focused on profit over care. Healthcare in this country was developed to be a commodity, unquote. And then I just want to offer in some of the writing that I do in the chapter Roots of the Medical Industrial Complex is to name that the, the MIC or the MIC, um, as it were, is rooted in ideologies and systems of colonization, population control, slavery, and eugenics. Historically, state models of healthcare services for mental, developmental, cognitive, and physical disabilities assisted living, substance abuse facilities, and prisons were all meant to preserve the idea of healthy and unhealthy populations and to isolate the unhealthy, quote, from healthy, quote. People with disabilities, Black, Indigenous people of color, lesbian, gay, bi, trans, queer, trans, two-spirit two and intersex, and institutionalized communities especially have been disposable and used for profiting the medical industrial complex through medical testing and experimentation. So I'm often looking at how the MIC is also rooted in the collection and theft of DNA and biological data of indigenous and people of color communities in the US and the global South against our will and unknowingly. So it's big, but there's some of the concepts of the medical industrial complex. Yeah, thank you so much. I read um, as I was reading that passage in in the book. I there's so much that resonated, mm -hmm. and I, I yeah, and I just also thinking about how we we think about. I know that this is different from how you you are working outside of the system, but thinking about policy work as well. Um, how how as a society we think about how about that binary. But I do have that question in the future, so I will wait for that. Um. So as we have both mentioned, we had that conversation in 2020 about the healing justice framework. Mm -hmm. And um, can you talk a little bit about how healing justice confronts the MIC? Yes, yes. I do want to reference the conversation we had in 2020 was really at the height of COVID. And what we were talking about, right, is like the huge, the huge health uh, disparities that were revealing themselves inside our system, our public health system, and understanding our relationship to disease as being um, a, a factor of control, social and political control, because there is a perception that some of us are diseased um, long before a pandemic, that those of us that are perceived as dangerous and bringing the disease, in particular, looking at the rise of anti-Asian violence during COVID and folks not understanding a historical arc and relationship to um, blaming, shaming, and um, creating a disease identity of Asian, specifically Chinese um, 
immigrants um, in the 1800s that um, were forcibly or, or choosing to come here and were being feared as bringing disease. We could apply this to many immigrant communities and certainly um, enslaved African people, um, so on and so forth. So just sort of understanding that this was not an isolated incident. Um, so that's one prime example, right, of how healing justice um, wanted to respond to the ways we perceive those who are endangered and diseased purely based on our genetic materials. And that that is part of a, a very old archaic idea of who should survive, right? The survival of the fittest. And those of us that are expendable are only here to take care of those who are meant to, to survive or be preserved in terms of. We're really looking at a healthcare system that is based on white, masculine, cis, wealthy, Christian, able body identity. And that health gets compared to that body and that lived experience. And the rest of us are just counter to that or in relationship to that body as being the healthy, pure, unendangered, non-diseased. It's such a falsehood, but we're still following that trajectory of what we consider to be healthy and care on top of carceral systems that have been created, right, to demonize or to completely divide and preserve those who are perceived as healthy by separating and isolating those who are feared to be diseased or who are seen as being diseased or having disabilities which is all seen as something negative, something dangerous, something, a predilection to violence. And so human justice said, wait a minute, if we're going to respond to generational trauma, we've got to look at ways practitioners participate in some of these old ideas of care. If we are not unraveling the fear and the perception that we are meant to fix or cure those who are seen as expendable and diseased. But instead ask the question, how are we building an interdependence of care that relies on all of us being in our bodies, having varying disabilities, genders, sexualities, lived experiences, and not trying to preserve one kind of body? Healing justice sought to ask that question especially in relationship to challenging ableist white supremacy and these eugenic ideas of care. Yeah, as usual, there's so, so much to think about there. And I have so, so many, yeah, so many follow-up questions, but I will, I will, I'll leave that. I'll leave that for now. Okay. So um, related to what you were talking about when you um, were talking about the historical and current harms uh, yes. to many populations. Can you talk more about your work to document those harms and abuses of the MIC and how that impacts us today? You talked a little bit about it, but could you elaborate? Great. Well, this time, last time when we spoke, we didn't yet have the um, MIC timeline. And I'll put that um, on the in the chat. Um, I'm proud and honored to be part of a project called the Healing Histories Project, which is really a team of organizers, healers, researchers, and curators, um, and just abolitionist folk that wanted to create a timeline that engaged people in understanding not only the history, but the contemporary ways the medical industrial complex continues to perpetuate harms, violence, and abuse um, through carceral systems, but also through cultural ideas and concepts of care um, and safety. And so we created a timeline from pre-colonization. We went way back, again, just based in the US, um, or shall we say North America, um, before it was colonized, and then take it all the way to here. We have about 95 filters, so you can actually curate your own sort of smaller timeline inside the big one if you want to hone in on particular filters like immigration reform, um, uh, abolition, uh, abortion, different concepts or theories, and you could recreate your own mini timeline to see how these things interact and intersect 
with the medical industrial complex. I am also, as a cultural worker, very interested in working with artists um, really around the world that I see challenging um, both the hypothetical and the, and the true stories of experimentation and medical harm and abuse. Some people I think are creating art that projects what's gonna happen in the future. Some of us are paying homage to what has already happened in the past and the present in relationship to how we see sites of harm through, through carceral systems like the medical industrial complex. And for me as an anti-violence black feminist queer organizer, I've been in anti-violence work for a very long time, but didn't see enough of the political conversation. Uh, we're talking about prisons. How are we talking about hospitals? How are we talking about um, uh, institutions that are institutionalizing people with disabilities, emotional, physical, developmental disabilities? How are we talking about um, clinics that are being he heightened in their ableism, right? So understanding that what we may preserve, preserve as care or systems of care is actually harmful and abusive to certain communities based on gender, sexuality, ability, class, what have you. So I am creating cultural um, installations, site-specific installations by going to a site where immense harm may have happened. My most recent project with Philip Sanchez is a virtual reality experience that people will see the story, um, a fictional story of the real live psychiatric hospital of, um, that was in Georgia, Central State Georgia, Milledgeville Hospital, that caused immense harm by testing and experimenting on poor black and white people in the 18th, 19th century in the South. So just sort of understanding that's one site, but we can think of many sites, I'm sure on this very call, right, of physical spaces that we know have caused harm in the MIC. Yeah, thank you for that. And I, I you know, I, one of the follow-up questions I had to your last um, response was like, for those who, want to learn more you know you, you you don't know what you don't know so then how how are you able to kind of get that that knowledge so what the examples you provided i don't i don't know if others in the who are watching this have other um, oh yes resources yes. to share um i think the more that we share the better so thank you thank you so much for those there are some great books coming out as well um I, i'm always a fan of dorothy roberts um who doesn't necessarily talk about sites of harm of the medical industrial complex, but really talks about the foundational implications of policy and legislation in this country that, that aligned and set up the MIC to be um, destructive and profit-driven. And she, in much of her work, really speaks to that, both in the medical technologies um, to just sort of the the ideas of eugenic and population control mandates by this country that ensured a public health system that would be deeply rooted in the removal of people of color, of disabled folk, of queer and trans, et cetera, and, and in the, the controlling of populations, again, based on disease, ideas of disease and danger. Um, she speaks to a lot of that, but there's new books coming. I'm very excited. And I do think disability justice as a movement and a political framework, um, there's more writing about that in particular and ableist supremacy. And I do think to do this work, you've got to center an anti-ableist um, lens. Yeah. It's critical. And healing justice centers that in our work as a, as a political strategy, but that's often the last thing people want to talk about is actually ableist supremacy. We'll touch race, we'll touch class, but we're not willing to really struggle with our, the implications of harm and abuse from ableist supremacy in this country, especially around cultures of care, well-being, wellness. It's all a curative and fixed model, and that is going to take a big cultural political shift for us to change. Yeah, so that's a lot to think about, especially for those joining who are are focused on mental health. That's, yeah, yeah, a lot to think about there. Right, because the question then is, is meant, it's not that we're creating mental health facilities to fix and cure, right? Is it, is the question, how are we creating mental health 
I, even facilities is a traveling word, but how are we creating care strategies that are led by the people that are most impacted by it, but also understanding we've got to unpack what we think care is. Exactly. And, right? And to, what we think mental health is and really wrestle with where did these perceptions come from and how are they embedded in colonization, slavery, and attempted genocide? <laughs> then step back and say, well, then what are we really trying to build here? Right, right. I promise, you know. I, I know. I promise for everybody listening, we're, we're going to get to hopeful questions too. <laughs> okay, great. I know. I see. I see it popping out here. Okay, cool. Um, okay, to reminder for everybody, please put in any um, questions that you have. I do see um, a couple of questions in it already, so, or a question, but okay. So um, where am I? Oh, so can you talk a little bit about how, so the book talks about how the MIC has co-opted healing modalities. Um, can you talk more about that? Uh, I think there has been more talk about it, generally about the concept of wellness and um, uh, generally about, about uh, e the, their co-optation of Eastern, Eastern therapies, but um, can you talk about more about how you how you uh, you all, you both frame it in the book. Yes, um, there's a great chapter written by my comrade Erica Woodland around contradictions. Um, several times we make mention in the book, um, even the even the use of healing justice, which you'll see out in the world, is actually being used also by a very reformist politic people um, working in more of a uh, pro policing. Uh, paradigm that that took the took the framing or at least the language and are using it for their purposes. But I just want to be crystal clear: it is my charge um, to always say that human justice was meant and was guided by abolitionist organizing, and that for us it was never about um, reforming um, carceral state, but actually abolishing um, carceral state systems, carceral systems, and actually re a, a reclaiming of what we want to define as collective care and safety and what that can look like, um, that we would really have to step away from any system of care that's deeply embedded, like I said, in colonization and slavery. And then where are we? What's possible? But what we're also seeing is when healing justice was taken as a political framework, it also was diffused of an anti-ableist lens, it was it was taken out of a black feminist abolitionist lens, it was taken out of the South. And for us, it was deeply embedded in a Southern tradition and response to slavery in the South. That's where healing justice emerges and draws from the lineages of survival of slavery by birth workers who literally birthed the next generation of black folk, right? Um, but what we're also saying or speaking to in the book is the question of co-optation of practices and traditions. Birth work, I always talk about. The role of birth work all over the world has been critical. Before it was privatized, indigenous people to their communities and traditions and regions were practicing birth work. In particular, in this country, in the US South, the implications of white Northern doctors traveling during the 50s and 60s, excuse me, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and borrowing, taking, stealing traditions of birth workers, otherwise known as midwives or doulas in the African-American tradition in the South, um, and also some indigenous traditions in the South, taking their practices, legitimizing them in the North, delegitimizing the practices in the South, and bringing licensure to midwives saying, if you don't get a license, you can't continue to birth work. They'd been doing thousands of births, but suddenly creating that sort of delegitimization of care by defining it based on licensure, based on reading and writing and schooling and not valuing lived experience of a tradition of care that had been passed on for centuries. That's one example of the, the absolute diffusion and neglect of the uh, 
the respect of care for a body of work and not seeing it valued because it wasn't inside of the hallowed halls of academia, but it was rooted in the traditions of community-led strategies. Is this making sense? Like I'm seeing birth yeah. workers who survived slavery and genocide as revolutionaries, Absolutely. right? Mm -hmm. um, as radical organizers, as radical healers. Um, but that co-optation of practice is one, just one example. We could go down the list, yes, of co-optation of different indigenous practices that are now being commodified. Um, for instance, um, you know, this question of big pharma and who now owns um, psychedelics. And now there's a big push to use psychedelics, but we're actually feeding back into a big pharma system of care that's stolen root medicines from root workers and now is commodifying it, you know, and still criminalizing root workers for their traditions. So we're holding these dichotomies. And I know we're going to talk about binaries, but this is a, another example, right? It's, um, you know, who is legitimate and who is not based on licensure, based on academia, based on assumptions of who is seen as the real healer. And then last but not least, I do want to toss in here that we're also looking at in the in the framework of healing justice, it is not self-care. Where we're looking at collective care in relationship to generational trauma and oppression, self-care is very important. But we were asking the question, what is the political possibility of building power as part of a strategy of responding to generational trauma from slavery and colonization, to even consider that we, not being all psychiatrists, therapists, social workers, could still come in and organize and collaborate on our collective care strategies without assuming someone has to be an expert to tell us how to respond to the trauma manifesting in our bodies, our psyches, our emotional, physical experiences, right? And I'm not saying, people say to me, well, you're saying that a surgeon can, you know, can a surgeon exist inside of this? And saying, I, I'll never be a heart surgeon, right? And I've had doctors say to me, well, you can't find a healer with a heart surgeon. And I say, why not? One, when does the heart surgeon not become a healer? Where did that happen, that they aren't seen as a healer themselves? And two, what is the possibility of a healer, earth body-based traditions working with a surgeon? Like, why are we so finite, right, in the boundaries and borders of care that we're not allowing for an integration of different types of medicines and modalities? There are some people that have pushed that limit, but there are many that have not, and we're still stuck in these very finite constructs of care that don't allow us to bend and shape to the needs of community and to the values of our people and what we how we think of care as spiritual, not just physical. <clears throat> Thank you, Kara. Yeah, I'm just, just Let's get like, some water, but yes. Oh yes, please. Um, this this is truly revolutionary, and I I um know that you talk about this more in the book too and I just one thing that um I also wanted to note that that you all know in the book around assumptions is that healing justice is not anti-science um which was I felt so I mean in some ways it feels like insulting that people don't think that you know that healing justice is rooted in science but uh, naming that I thought was very, very important. Thank you. Um, we actually, we being um, at the Healing Histories Project when we were con de designing the NYC timeline. Sorry, y'all, there's allergies. Well, it's just living in this weather. But um, in, here I am in Brooklyn, New York, on well, nothing, on sea land, um, in some heat and allergy weather. But essentially, when we were pulling the timeline together and looking for resources, we got challenged by some people who said, well, we can't, we don't know how to support you because you're critiquing the public health system. And right now, you know, at that time, Trump is also critiquing the public health system. And we were also critiquing the response to COVID. And they said, well, well that, that's aligned with Trump and he's anti-science. And we we're like, wait a minute, <laughs> hold on a second. One, we're not aligned with Trump. And two, if to critique the public health system is, is 
it is for us, it's neither neoliberal nor is it neoconservative. It's a, it's a necessary political strategy. And it certainly does not align with anti-science, but it, it aligns with the question, where, where has science failed us? Where has science not integrated a careful understanding of the implications of racism, classism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism inside of how scientific research has been done? It's, so it's a question of how do we do this with dignity and respect to do good science, science that is um, not relegating us to dangerous, non-dangerous, you know, diseased, non-diseased. That is what we're asking for. And to me, that's, that is a political require that should be a political requirement to ethical research and ethical uses of science for care. And I know there are many people that do that work. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Um, I'm looking at the time and I still have many questions for you. Um, okay, so I will ask one more question and then I'll open it up for the Q&A and then if there's time, I'll, I'll, I'll keep asking you questions. Okay, so... Um, um, I can't okay so we'll talk about the binary because I because I had asked you about the binary earlier so I, I think in in mental health in public health I have been trying to really counteract this narrative um and I'll, I know I a few people are trying to do this like um trying to counter counter out this narrative between um showing the binary of of um, nor what is normal and what is abnormal. Um, and we really see that reflected where normal is based on white dominant culture. Um, so you talked a lot about how it shows up in, in the MIC, but what can we do, what can we do to, to fight against it? I appreciate this question. And I do think it's the work of class, right? I mean, I was like, but you do this. This is what you do, right? You're exploring or discovering ways that we can get outside the this paradigm. Um, I, I do think it will require some innovative thinking around how we define um, how we define care. In the simplest of terms, for my for me as an organizer who's organized against violence in the medical industrial complex, I've come together with practitioners, healing, health practitioners, social workers. Right now we're on a tour with this book, a listening and cultural memory tour, much in the same um, tradition of the Zapatistas, understanding what are people responding to in the conditions of their political, cultural, spiritual lives where they are living and doing their work. And, I do think we're at a heightened moment of climate disasters and um, policing disasters and um, and just a moment of in, intense um, unknowing, right? And I still consider we're still living in the COVID portal where we just don't know what is coming next, but now we know the most extreme of something that can happen that would shut the world down um, it's it's a moment. There's some knowing and reflecting we still need to do. And I think that is why it is such a fertile moment to ask the question. We were shut in by the United States government to respond to a global pandemic. And many people struggled with relying and depending on the U.S. government for their care. And many people felt unsafe, right? didn't feel cared for because they weren't. So how do we just simply sit down and say, what does collective care look like? Um, what do we imagine carceral systems, if we really are going to uh, abolish carceral systems, what are we going to create in their place? This sounds very simple, but it, you know, I, I do believe in the work and the mentorship of folks like Mariam Kaba, who are simply asking, where are we gathering people to ask these questions together across spheres? Not just organizers, not just practitioners, but where are we moving together in real time? Um, 
asking these questions together. I think there's still a lot of divide and conquer where we're not having collaborative conversations. That's why I loved class. That's what you do. I also have worked with CAR, Campaign Against Racism, which is a global network of nurses and practitioners and doctors asking the question, how do we fight racial capitalism and not repeat the violence of the MIC as healers? How do we remain accountable and politically aligned with the communities we are serving? There are many people asking these same questions. And I do think it's a vibrant moment because we all know what an extreme situation of not being cared for can look like. And we didn't have that knowledge 10 years ago. Right. No, I think that's really beautiful. And I I, I know that within the disability justice movement to Yes, thank you. They're doing the same, yes. right? Yeah. Pushing us to get right. outside of these paradigms. Um, I think we need insider outsider strategies, right? Some of us have got to be in the system. That's not the question. It's how do you then not isolate yourself to to bring change and to wrestle with what is possible in the same ways we're doing it on the outside. And I do think disability, the disability justice movement and the transformative justice movement, another movement that asks, how do we not rely on state to provide us with care and safety? Holding those two movements and healing justice as a as a strategy inside of those movements, how do we how do we imagine care that values multiple experiences? That makes this idea of collective care complex. But I still think we need to wrestle. Yeah, I can. And that's been the loss is not being willing to say I don't know. We don't know what is possible. Let's lean in and try and take some risks, make some mistakes, work it out. Yes, that's that's really really beautiful. Okay, thank you for that. I I have two questions here. So the first is from Supriya. Hi, Supriya. Um, so the question is, how are you thinking about and talking about the mental health distress, illness of the mind and psyche, psyche broadly outside of pathologization and medical terms? Do you want me to put, to put this in the chat? Yeah, if you could put it in the chat. And I don't Thank you for... I mean, I, I'm curious what I'm curious what what Supriya thinks of this question. I mean, I guess because if we're trying to depathologize ways we think about um, health, distress, illness, mind, psyche outside of pathologization, yeah, I I do think. I'm less experienced in mental health per se, but I am working with, or I am working with social workers and. Um, social workers, therapists, and psychiatrists that are trying to play with ways to think about mental health, well-being, care, um, outside of pathologizing. But I, what I'm seeing is deep study, that they're actually studying where did the definitions of um, these things, where, where did they become pathologized? It's like sort of like to go back in to understand what are the tools that our schools have taught us about mental health distress illness psychic disruptions so on and so forth understand where those definitions and pathologies come from and then wrestle with okay so how do we move outside of it so that it doesn't presume a modality of care for the clients we're working with and then there's also this question of where are people most impacted living with these um experiences of mental health distress, whatever they choose to call it, where are we able to set the tone of what we want care to look like, right? Where where can we engage more with the possibility? And I do want to give a, a shout out to Fireweed Collective um, that does a tremendous amount of work, right? And redefining and depathologizing care outside of uh, a lens, of, again, of ableist supremacy, especially around mental health. Uh, and also spaces like, as I mentioned myself, working at the Healing Histories Project, there's also Health Justice Commons, uh, the National Queer and Trans Therapists of Color Network, people that are actively deep studying 
the MIC and then asking the question as practitioners, how will we not perpetuate harm and abuse by using this language and using these modalities? So all I say is great question. And I think that's what we need to do is create generative space where we can wrestle with this question. <laughs> that's all I've got, I think, because we're at the beginning, I think. We don't know yet. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Thank you. Okay. Second question is, what are your thoughts on the personal development and training industry and its historical focus on individualism, reinforcement of white supremacy culture? What? The book is all about. What are <laughs> my thoughts? It's in the book. Read, get the book. Get the book. Um, I mean, we spend a whole chapter on why we organize practitioners, how we dismantle the MIC. Uh, there's so many things to say, but um, will a resource list be sent via email? Oh, Isha, we'll have to talk about that. <laughs> yes, I yeah, I was starting to write down resources. Okay. Yeah, yes, great, we, great, uh, great. Kara, I will reach out to you afterwards. Because I've said a lot of names. Yes, there's yeah. some people doing some great work out here, y'all. And I don't know all of them, so please add to it. Oh, thank you for ordering the book. Awesome. But um, absolutely, if you can drop the, the question in the chat, I guess I want to say everything I'm doing is about countering white supremacy, ableist supremacy, gender supremacy on the ideas of care. Um, and I'm coming across, I can't tell you how many people I am meeting on this journey, um, both in the U.S. and globally, especially in the global South, that are really wrestling with these questions. Whether or not we call it healing justice or not, um, there is a precipice that we are on that I think is creating a generative space um, to not only focus on individual care, but to understand, much like the disability justice movement speaks to, an interdependence. How will we take care of each other and understand the complexities that we will have different needs and desires for our care and safety? And it's not going to be linear. We're going to have to lean in and figure out how do I make sure I'm not um, uh, participating in your harm? but actually building safety and care together. I, I think it's gonna look very different in different contexts, conditions, based on trust, based on our relationships, based on our understanding of being willing to take risk. Um, that's that's my thoughts, but Thanks. they're all in the book. <laughs> yes, and sitting in discomfort, right? <laughs> sitting in discomfort, absolutely. absolutely. Okay, Alex from our team ask the question, how do you address and disengage the emotional response people often have as a reaction to movements that are anti, insert systemic, <laughs> <laughs> for example, anti-racism or anti-ableist when they see it as a personal attack? Oh, this is interesting. I mean, I mean, we are definitely living in a social media can cancel culture world. So I'm not sure if that's speaking somewhat to that, um, where I think people are being called out, right? Um, I find what I am most challenged by right now for myself as I age, as I'm in my 50s, climbing, climbing up in age is, um, is understanding an intergenerational relationship to ideas. Um, hold on, it's gonna come back to what you're asking, but I think we've made a lot of assumptions about each other. And I'm just speaking broad, broad, broad sense, but here I sit in multiple movements at the intersections of multiple movements, having worked, organized with, and, um, and now creating a book, a tool, a timeline, different ways that I saw space and gaps of information and deep study to sit in reflection with my comrades, with, with community. Not everyone's in a movement, I don't think that, but, but how do we understand our relationship to these uh, systemic oppressions? And I think we've fallen out of relationship to each other with social media, um, with just, and I'm a media maker, but so I say this very intentionally, how are we intentionally creating co-generative space to study and learn together across generations, across spheres, across abilities? Like, 
if we're really not in the praxis of really building co-generative space and relationships inside movement, outside movement, across movement, um, I'm deeply concerned that we've forgotten how to genuinely have conversation and struggle. There's a quote in the book, um, perfect, I'll end on this, uh, by Barbara Smith in the, in the chapter Black Prince for Freedom, where I interview the elders, um, mentor movement leaders, um, Barbara Smith and Miss Major, where I ask about collective care and safety. And Barbara Smith says, I don't think that movements are supposed to be safe. I think that people should be respected in movements and that they should not be abused within movements. But that to me is maybe word choice. I would not talk about that as safety per se, because the thing is, I feel like if the focus is on safety, we may not go to the wall when we need to go to the wall. You cannot be safe under systems of massive oppression. It's not possible while we live under heteropatriarchy and racial capitalism. So can we draw, we can draw lines about what we will accept as far as our physical integrity, our emotional and spiritual integrity in our lives, but we can never expect to be safe under white supremacy. So with that, I say, we've got to learn again, the muscle of struggling together and not feeling personally attacked, but actually accountable to each other without a defiance, but actually a relationship that requires we will need to be able to ask each other questions and ask each other how to be accountable and transform ableism, racism, sexism, what have you. But if we can't even get to struggle, I think we are out of practice. Uh you've given us a lot to think about and what a way to close us out with a Barbara Smith quote. Hello, <laughs> my honor, her honor. <laughs> yeah, so we lean on on those who have built built um, That's right. these movements before us. So um, with that, I will close us out, but I do want to share mm -hmm. that we are, um, there were so many more questions I had, you don't care. I know, we only, only get to half. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we have, um, this is a part of our series, right? So we have one, two more um, focus on healing center frameworks and practice, and then um, a webinar on policies to decolonize mental health. So um, please join us for those other webinars. And we really thank, thank you all for joining us. And Kara, it was really thank our, you. our honor to have you here with us. Yes. Thank you so My much. My pleasure. Always a pleasure to speak with you, Isha. And class, you're brilliant. Thank you for your work. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank yes. you all.